that's what I thought. Yeah. Alright, so, anyway, uh, let's go ahead and, and go back here, and I want to show you one more thing that's going to be my amazing friend on my trip through China. So, as uh, we're going to go ahead and bring up here is a web application. So I have infinite access to all my broadband, and what I have here is a web application called Everyscape. And the best part about Everyscape is we're actually going to be taking a full-on walking tour of Beijing. Full panoramic views, all at the eye level. So here's the real gist, is we're in Beijing, and I want to get to the Intel office. Now they've told me it's walking center within the carry center. It's in the carry center. Yep. So unfortunately, it's not quite that easy. Left, right. However, with this type of software, I can go ahead and access where I need to go and not only be able to get turn-by-turn -turn directions, but actually see where I'm going before I even put my feet to the street. That'd be useful. So let's go ahead and, as I'm actually coming out of the uh, the carry center right here, I just absolutely love this program. And now I remember, you have to go through the mall, and we're actually outside of the Intel building right here. So let's go ahead and take a peek inside the lobby. All of this augmented reality can be used to identify other leaseholders in the same building, but I'm going to take it over here to the directory. And there we are. And let's go ahead and take the elevator up. There we are. And this is our actual office inside Beijing. So, talk about something really amazing. And by this time, I haven't even left my hotel room yet. You know, Craig, I think this would be a great business tool, but I suspect it would also be even better for vacations and personal use. We're not all about work here at Intel, Paul. Obviously. So, uh, when we're talking about some great vacations, can't say vacation with in Beijing at least without going to the wall. Go to the Great Wall. Let's go ahead and take a look. So uh, you know what I'm a big fan of is uh, when you go to the museums and tours and see all those sort of things. You can get the little headphones and yep. the audio, and it's important to have that kind of information ready at your fingertips. Well, we had a little broadband, my private MID device that's right for me, and maybe we can go ahead and get some information on the fly from our virtual terracotta warrior here. Let's see what he has to say. Welcome to the Bagalin section of the Great Wall. You can find out more about the Great Wall by choosing from the following. Pretty amazing, right? So not only do I have this all access to my fingertips, I get points of interest, what exactly that I'm looking at in the distance, and maybe some of the most pertinent information when you're stranded on the, the wall. The bathroom is located on the meters <laughs> that way. So in case you're in a real race, I'm going to go ahead and take a look at something like my real scenery. Now, isn't that cool? So, in just in case I need to pull an actual sprint to get where I'm going, I'll have full directions on how to get there. That's just awesome. Yeah. What we just saw was an example of, of the internet seamlessly bringing information we need based, based on our requirement at the point in time, independent of the activity and the type of device. We didn't have to be connected to a particular search engine. It was all context to where it knew the information and had access to the databases to understand the context to give you the information. We had what we needed when we needed it. Correct. Even better, what you saw was real. What we're able to do here was simultaneous translation, search, and download real data from an internet visual database. However, there was one minor problem, right Craig? There is one catch. So while we're using all of these usage models and the applications are very, very real on the mobile internet device, we are using a couple of cycles from core to dual machines. However, Working at Intel, it's not going to be more than a blink before we make that future real. I would hope so. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Craig. And that, you know, Craig's last point was really the point of this demo: doing things like real-time translation, augmented reality, making real-time use of these huge visual databases will require exponentially more powerful processors that also are exponentially using less and less power. In order, to, when that happens, we can then shrink the devices to be able to have things that you carry around that have the kind of capability you just saw replicated backstage on a much more powerful computer. And that's exactly what Intel's going to deliver in the next three to five years. That was one example of how a more personal, proactive internet is going to benefit us. And while the demonstration was about travel, the same technology will also have applications on the factory floor or even when you go shopping. What you saw in, in, the, in the demo will be possible in the not too distant future. There are some obstacles standing in our way. The first obstacle to delivering this experience we just saw is silicon. 
we need more powerful, more energy efficient microprocessors. The second obstacle is that we need a ubiquitous wireless broadband infrastructure. The third obstacle is that the internet today lacks the context about what we need. And lastly, we need much more natural user interfaces. Each obstacle in and of itself is a challenge. Together, they're, they're very, very daunting. At Intel, though, we like challenges, and we're working hard to deliver the solutions. Silicon building blocks, wireless connectivity, and other enabling technologies like visualization and gesture computing that make this vision a reality. But we can't do it alone, nor are we trying to. Development of the personal internet requires an ecosystem. We need the smartest minds from multiple industries working together to create new business models. The opportunity for those in this room in the CE industry lies in creating this next generation of devices and services that go with them. But first we need to overcome the obstacles I've just listed. Silicon is the foundation of all things that connect to the internet. Let's start by discussing the progress being made in silicon technology today. Silicon chips today are really just collections of structures called transistors that do the work of computing. Big things happen when we shrink transistors. And shrinking the transistor is the answer to addressing the silicon needs of tomorrow's personal internet. The silicon industry has been shrinking transistors since its founding. The idea of framing this progression is called Moore's Law, an observation made about 40 years ago by Gordon Moore, Intel's co-founder. Essentially, Gordon saw that silicon technology was progressing at a very predictable rate. Every 18 to 24 months, we reduce the size of the transistors enough to double the number of uh, transistors on any given chip. Now, let me put this in perspective. Our first microprocessor was introduced in 1971, and it was called the 4004. It, it contained 2,250 transistors, each of which was 10 microns in size. Our latest quad-core microprocessor has 820 million transistors. If we had used the same size transistor in the original 4004 to build this 820 million transistor quad-core machine, the die would be 9 feet by 6 feet, or the actual size of the plot standing behind me. It would consume the energy of 200 U.S. households. But, but thanks to Moore's Law and our ability to continually shrink the size of the transistors, it's actually, the real chip is actually 93,000 times smaller, about the size of your thumbnail, and consumes 2,000 times less energy. If shrinking is the key to solving our problem, you might wonder how small is small. As Intel CEO, I'm proud to say that Intel has led the silicon industry into the nano world. Our latest manufacturing process builds transistors 45 nanometers in size. So how big is a nanometer? Well, a nanometer is one billionth of a meter. That's really small. To put this in perspective, a nanometer is to a meter as this marble is to the planet Earth. The real Earth, not the image behind me. Working in this incredibly small world presents extremely difficult problems. Ten years ago, our scientists identified a major problem in shrinking transistors. As we made the transistors smaller, we found that they leaked more current, they created heat and power consumption problems at the die level and at the device level. Moore's Law might have come to an end by now. However, our engineers found new techniques, a new recipe for making transistors using what we call a high K metal gauge structure. To this structure, we added the element hafnium to our transistor recipe for the first time.